Can, uh, you guys can hear me, right? Yes. All right. Before we do those things that have to be done, I have to obviously observe protocol. I would like to honor the C, Honorable yes. Bernardo Swampoy. Yes. Yes. And his deputy, Honorable Sabre. Yes. And our beautiful first lady. Yeah. And then we got our vibrant counselor. Yeah. But without, you see, this is why we are here as leaders. This is the youth and we have a representative of a very vibrant woman. Strong, powerful, beautiful, yes. brilliant woman. That's not all. She is an honorable in the making. <laughs> Duminga. <laughs> I'll further like to greet the LPM leadership, youth leadership that I now miss. And everyone that has come from different regions, you are welcome and we appreciate you for coming here. Just please clap them for yourself. <laughs> So today we're here to talk about reigniting youth participation in modern politics. Now, over the years we have seen, history has told us that young people have taken charge of our liberation through the Black Panthers, through apartheid, etc. But now as young people, especially of this century, where do we place ourselves? Where do we find ourselves in the global politics? In the Namibian um, spectrum, what pivotal role do we play as young people? And that is why it's important that today's program does not only stretch into the, con the ideologies of the Prince of, of LPM, but looks into igniting our, our consciousness to get that servanthood spirit out of us. Young people, we are about 60% of the population in Namibia. We are a lot. But what has been done to ensure that we are participating in the decision-making processes. Are we just there screaming from outside or are we part of the table in where decisions are made, policy implementations and et cetera? And this is why today's program is very important. And as we, take, as we start today, we must ensure that everything that's being discussed, whether you don't understand, you ask questions, you must participate to ensure that when we go back into society, will be leaders that are here to change society and not just be Facebook politicians. Am I right? Yes. yes. So without further ado, I'd like to call the first person on our program, which is the Honorable Domingandala, to give the welcoming remarks. So they, uh, in this program, you not right. Yeah, take this one. Take this. That was the wrong program. My apologies. So you see, there's this thing that we do, Namibians, we are so very friendly people. You cannot come into someone's house, you cannot come into a place and not be greeted. And we need to be welcomed because the program has not started without being welcomed. The next person to give our welcoming remarks shall be the Honorable Shade Governors. Shade.
Okay, perfect. Do we have the mic working or is the voice clear? Are we are we good? Uh, social media, we can we can also is it is it fine? Okay, perfect. Um Honorable Utara has has basically already done the welcoming, but as 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 I've been delegated, I shall then also do the same and also a roll call um, just to welcome all our delegates. Um, first of all, I would like to say um, to Honorable Bernardo Swartboy, Honorable Henny Sebe, Honorable Utara Motu, leadership, all our youth delegates, all regional leadership that is present, all esteemed guests, media, all protocols observed, good morning. A special, special welcome to all our delegates from the Kunene. May we please have all of you stand, all our delegates from the Kunene region. Thank you very much. Welcome. All, <laughs> all our delegates are from the, I'll, I think I'll do Comas the last. We will take Karas, all our delegates from the Karas region. All our delegates from the Ochunzanjupa region, please. Yes, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right. All our delegates from the Hartab region, please. All our delegates from the Oshikoto region, please. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And then all our delegates from Comas. Last but not, not least, we also have the Erongo region present. May we please have all the delegates in. <laughs> Omaheke, do we have Omaheke present? Joyce. Joyce. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable. Oshana. I hope I haven't missed out. According to the register list, I have all the delegates from the different regions. Once again, welcome. My name is Shade Shireen Governors, and it's my privilege and pleasure on behalf of the Youth Command Element to welcome you all here today. We are delighted to have you with us to participate and share with us our first youth conference from, and for many more to come. Thank you for being with us here and to all of you that have traveled long distances to be here. It's just a reminder of the important work that we have to do and that is still yet to come. The youth command element is committed and excited to be part of the great change in the political discourse of our country, to be the center stone in understanding politics, political philosophy, political theory, and the study of governance. The legitimacy of public agents and institutions and the relationships between them. Talks about liberty, justice, property rights, law, the enforcement of law, and what makes a government legitimate. What rights and freedoms does it and should it protect? What form is it should it take and what duties do citizens owe to a legitimate government, if any, and when it may be legitimately removed, mm. if ever. Yeah. Our theme, reigniting youth participation in modern politics, is refreshing. It's reinvigorating. When young people are disenfranchised or disengaged from political processes, a significant portion of the population has little or no voice or influence in, de in decisions that affect groups and members' lives. A key consequence is the undermining of political systems and represent, representation. To make a difference, it is essential that young people engage in formal political processes and have a say in formulating today and tomorrow's politics. Yeah. Inclusive political participation. Yeah. 
Inclusive political participation is not only a fundamental political and democratic right, but also crucial in building stable, peaceful institutions, societies, and developing policies that respond to the specific needs of our youth today. Youth should be adequately represented. Youth should know their rights. Youth must have the necessary knowledge and capacity to participate in a meaningful way in all avenues. I would like to share with you a quote from Kofi Annan. I quote, young people should be at the forefront of global change and innovation. Empowered, they can be key agents for development and peace. If, however, they are left on society's margins, all of us will be impoverished. Let us ensure that all young people have opportunity to participate fully in the lives of their society. With that being said, I welcome you all. Okay. <laughs> honorable, honorable say that we, 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 we have a few of, um, we don't, we don't want the honorable titles and yes, the, yes. we are, we have made it sort of attitude mm -hmm. in the midst of our leaders. We want to remain humble. We want to remain amongst the people. But as protocol desires, I will then take and reintroduce myself. My name is Honorable Councillor Shade Shireen Governors, and I'm one of the councillors which have then obviously been elected um, and voted in by the Comas region into the city of Vintuk mm. Municipal Council. Thank you. You see, leadership, LPM is not here for jokes. We do not use youth and throw them away. We put them in our structures. We have them here. Honorable members, did I just, should I, should I tell them how old you are? Yes. <laughs> 32 years old, right? Yes. Turning 33. Yeah, I turned 33. Turned 33. You see, young people in leadership. Well, because when we started earlier, I came with such energy, I wanted to hype you guys. But now we have another session on the program where the choir will be presenting their piece here to entertain us. And I know we've already been entertained when we started, but anyways, we're young people, we like having fun. So I'd just like to call up the choir. The choir. Yes. You may please come to the front. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 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 
I really enjoyed that performance. Now, before we go into the next item, I'd also like to uh, welcome two of our leadership that are in our presence. I would like to welcome our Iron Lady, our Treasury General, May Aina Kodi. <laughs> and I would also like to welcome our vibrant, fierce Deputy National Spokesperson, an executive of the Vajero Genocide Committee, Arikana J. Samudengwa. <laughs> Next on our item would be Ms. Domingandala, the Secretary of the Youth Element Command. And she'll be talking about the foundation of LPM Youth Command Element, yes. and it's important in Namibian politics. <laughs> Halala LPM halala. Halala. LPM. We are one. We are, one. LPM. are you excited to be in this place? Oh, yes. yes. I would like to observe the protocols already mentioned. And uh, first and foremost, I would like to acknowledge the presence of God. It's because of his strength that this event yes. we, we managed to pull up this event. Yes. So my task, uh, it's a very short but a very important one. So I'm going to deliberate on the foundation of the LPM Youth Command element, mm -hmm. as well as its importance in Namibian politics. So I want you guys to listen very attentively. Mm -hmm. So um, the hour of youth has struck once again. As we are gathered in this glorious moment, we must reaffirm and rededicate ourselves to the founding idols and principles that continue to shape our struggles from the bondage of economic impression, oppression. As we, as we pursue the noble, uh, the noble ideal of a free society that is truly non-racist, non-sexist, truly emancipa emancipated, we must remain committed to the promises that we make to our people, and that's the, rest uh, the restoration of their dignity. The LPM Youth Command element was founded in 2018 upon the principles of inclusiveness, diversity, equality of all, and constitutional democracy. It was established to plug the gaps of youth representation in the political arena and groom young leaders that are committed to the fight for social justice, human dignity, and political transformation of the Namibian society. The, ob the objectives of L the LPM Youth Command are to promote the interests of young people in Namibia and to galvanize the youth to, set to step up the fight against inequality within the country. Young people make 60% of the world's population, yet they are the most impoverished, suppressed, and neglected by the ruling bourgeoisie and the political incumbent. In the words of Franz Fanon, each generation must, must discover its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. Today, here, and now, we reiterate that call to the young people of Namibia, especially the LPM youth, to discover their mission and race to the, to the occasion in defining and realizing their mission. The existence of LPM Youth Command remain, a fundamental, remain fundamental in Namibian politics, especially in a time where there is a vacuum of ethical and skilled political leaders. Therefore, our primary role as the LPM Youth should be to implore a people-centric leadership, one that lessens to the plight of people, particularly young people that has lost hope in our governance system and political institutions. 
We aspire. <laughs> Um, we aspire to move people from being good citizens into being active and exemplary citizens that will be key players in the building of stable and peaceful societies and developing policies that respond to the specific needs of younger generations. Our social economic well-being is under threat in the hands of the ruling elites that continue to undermine the economic pride of the, of the Namibian youth. Therefore, we must ensure that the youth have access to education and are equitably capacitated to provide our national with intellectual cap uh, capital. It is on this prom premise that we as a youth wing will continue to campaign for quality universal education for all Namibians. Similarly, we must double our efforts in building a generation that, st that sets the agenda in public discourse through a culture of reading and writing. Mm -hmm. We remain confident that after today, this two day leadership training, we will forge towards the implementation of the integrated youth development strategy that cut across all sectors, accelerating youth development and ensuring that interventions in this regard are tangible and sustainable. We should therefore remain steady and committed to the core values of their organization and fight towards true economic emancipation in our lifetime. I thank you. Can you give another round of applause? That's a student, guys. We are heading in the right direction as LPM. You know, when she just spoke about our responsibility to promote the interest of young people and to ensure that there is social justice for young people, I was really touched by my, my, my president. <laughs> Next on the program, are we allowed to have another session for the choir? But only one song. We'll just restrict it to one of the songs before we call up the next speaker. The choir, one or two songs. Yeah. 
They are called Vocality from Korea Hub Dam. Give them another shout. Yeah. Before I call up the next speaker for the official address, opening address, I would like to also give notice and give honor to someone who's in our presence today. Her name is Deputy Mayor Sharin Fox, yes. Mayor of Marintal, 26 yes. year old. Take the seat, please. Can we continue for her? Another person, you see, the problem is you cannot just give notice to one lead of some leadership and leave others aside. Because LPM, we empower our youth with so many young people in leadership positions. But I'd also like to talk, uh, um, give identification, give honor to our honorable counselor from Mariental, chairperson of the Mariental Council. <laughs> In fact, all of us, let's just go sit there. Yeah. Um, I'm tired. Seriously, there are too many young leaders here. Focus on Ivan Steerman, Honorable Ivan Steerman, uh -uh. Ivan Scraver, <laughs> Helena Steerman, Honorable Ivan Scraver, <laughs> City of Belchuk. <laughs> Chairperson of Commerce Region, are you here? Thank you very much. Now, it is my distinct honor to introduce the next speaker. He is not just the leader of this movement, yes. but he's the future for this country. Yes. <laughs> he is the, he is the 
need a chief change campaigner. song is not a very good song yeah, yeah. that that song is about uh, uh, sugar mummies and sugar daddies and this is, uh, let's just be careful about some of the songs anyway i thank utara motu honorable utara motu the program director and i recognize the deputy uh, the treasurer general and all of the national leaders, including the regional commissar Clifford Kluter, who just arrived. And then in particular, also we recognize Dominga Kakuhu Ndala, the command element leader. We give warm greetings to all of you as delegates that are present here. We know some of you traveled early in the morning, others came last night. Some of you did not sleep the whole evening yeah. <laughs> we we understand young people have a bit of uh, uh, that flows very strong and so on so we greet you we recognize you we acknowledge all of you all the delegates that have come from about seven or eight regions this time we have delegates i'm told also from gavango east and gavango west I think some delegates from Oshana, Oshikoto, I think some from Ohangwena would probably be late or something of that sort. Um, I also take chance to recognize uh, one of the council members, Stierman, I think, of um, Gohas, a village council there in the Arga region. When you just look at the table behind me, you could see the dominance and that is how we want it of the women mm. and the decline of uh, the numerical presence of men <laughs> but we must not take too much of uh, that also <laughs> there must be balance <laughs> lpm yeah. we are one 
Uh, if you could also, I was gossiping with leader Henny, the creativity of some of the leaders in the youth wing, the element, if Romeo could just stand so that you can see his hair, Romario. Uh, that, that could... I, I don't know what sort of dookie that is, but it's some sort of a, a dookie. So we are happy that you are here. We are very pleased and congratulate uh, Kapu Hu Yu for your hard work with your team. Uh, the team is here. Uh, the young ones, Pluta and others, uh, they are here. We also want to recognize, because I think we are not doing very well sometimes with protocol members. Mm. That, is, that is a problem. Uh -huh. We play music while the anthem has to be played. There's uh -huh. something else being played. These things we talk about every day, because that sets the scene for how young people are prepared to lead society. That's why we are strict, and I was a bit irritated when I was in front, when you have to come in silence. People take the podium, silence. Then, national anthem. Prayer, national anthem. Then the protocol is read. Who is here, from where, roll call is made. Then we know who is here. Then you take your seat. But now someone is screaming something else, someone is saying something else. And, and this is important. I was on my way, I thought about this matter, and I want to highlight that a number of years back, Henny and I organized a major international conference. It was called the Africa-China Youth Conference, the first of its kind on the planet. You see how you must use words to make something big. <laughs> uh, on the planet. Mumunu. Mm. The African delegates would be late. And we would check. The Chinese would come as robots 20 minutes before time. Some may have eaten, some may have not eaten, we didn't know. But for three days they would be there, 20 minutes before the time, absolute silence. The Africans, some of them smelling babalas and all of these things, would come late and they would be talking and, and just looking for pens and for paper just saw, shoo, look at those from China, no wonder their society has developed. Look at us from Africa, no wonder we still have basic water, housing, sanitation problems. So whenever we complain about protocol issues, it's not about wanting to be recognized who has that position or what, it's about structuring ourselves in a manner that shows that we are organized as a formation to move society forward. That is what it is all about. And young people will have to learn, and all of us have to learn. Joseph Disho spoke one day, and I was governor. I had stormed from one meeting to another, and I just arrived two minutes late. And, of course, we are good friends. He was laughing and says, Africans wear expensive wristwatches but they are late for meetings. So why is the watch being worn? Is it for decoration or a sign that I can afford an expensive watch? Or what is it that we're wearing it for? These are important values that we must instill among ourselves. This meeting of ours was supposed to start this morning, nine o'clock. You are young people. When we had a discussion, panel discussion about four or five years back, I came on time with former minister Alfius Ngarusep. The ones leading the program came 30 minutes late. And he says, it's it. I thought you young people are better than old people. <laughs> Just to keep time is a problem. Now, if delegates did not have food on time, there must be such discipline that you would say, even if I have not eaten, nine o'clock means opening of the program. Even if I have not used the bathroom, nine o'clock means program starts. This thing sounds small, but you go to Germany. If the train 
has to arrive at nine o'clock. It arrives that time. If you are late for five minutes, you see that train going further, faster and faster away. You are late and therefore you are not on the journey that would have taken you to your destination. Germany. I attended a meeting and Henny and I made fun of these meetings in Mali with the then Deputy Prime Minister Libertina. It was a three-day meeting. Three days. Day one, presidents and these people opened that meeting, supposedly. So suited up, properly dressed, sprayed up. <laughs> Coming from Southern Africa. Mali, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock. Those of us that are young from Southern Africa start asking, oh, now the time? Then you found those Africans with the big ties. You know where the tie is big here? <laughs> those ones that have arrived, huh? So my brother, you are concerned about time. Eat your food and make friends of network. <laughs> Day one passed, no meeting started. Day two passed, no meeting started. So I decided to take a walk to the river because there's a big river there. Hmm. On my way, crossing the bridge of the big river, we are called. The French president has arrived. The meeting starts now in 10 minutes. Third day, the meeting starts. Resolutions are already prepared. Okay, maybe that efficiency I must appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> they said, this is African time. But if we do not take care in this country and in LPM about time, sometimes we understand you can late. Sometimes just something happens. That, that is understood. But if you can learn to respect time. I used to be very, very specific about time. Some, some of the days I find myself also having deteriorated a little bit with time. The, the long speech give sometimes irritate me also. I'm learning to space myself in. But I want to highlight this matter of time because it has to do with discipline and the type of society you want to construct. When I was governor, uh, you found kids on their way in the morning to school with the shirt not tucked in. And it was strange for me because where are the parents that must check that morning that child has his or her shirt tucked in properly? Then in the afternoon, I would go around Again, the moment they leave the school terrain, the shirt again is outside. And it shows you a degree of deterioration of discipline in society. Because that child who has his or her shirt not tucked in, 14-year-old, 6-year-old, by now, that was 2010, 2012, 2014, when I was governor, they are now at university, they may have their first child, there may be workers who probably don't arrive on time or their overalls are probably dirty. These are indications of whether or not a society is disciplined and on a way to a right direction or degenerating and on a trajectory fast backward. I am not glorifying countries like China. There are things that we have with China that we're worried about. But when you go to some of those societies in the eastern part of the world, some in the western part, China, South Korea, how every generation, and Dominga mentioned it a little bit, how every generation takes time to understand and in internalize its responsibility. Some of your mothers here, some of your fathers, some of you here are uncles, some of you are firstborns. There are people at 
household in your family that look up to you. How have you internalized your responsibility as a person that must lead society as an agent of change? So do you see on a simple issue of starting a program later than meant to be, what all sorts of things we may be losing? And I've not even started formally with what I want to say. So in those societies, the responsibility of each and every generation is imprinted deeply in them. You speak to a 25-year-old, they would already tell you, I cannot get a child now because my father has worked hard. His generation has worked hard to produce what we have now. I have to work hard and I get my master's and my PhD. So I give myself seven years before I get my first child because housing is also a problem here. You go to those countries, they have lots of flats because land space is a problem. And I, would, I may never buy a car because parking is a problem, but I will not get a child because my responsibility to take it from where I'm given now is very important. Therefore, when and how many children I get matters to my planning program. And this is probably a 25-year-old child speaking. And I was a governor, say, I'm saying, my God, but the way I was pretending, yeah, of course you are correct indeed, these are important things. And, but I was just thinking, phew, the understanding of this 25-year-old about the role of his or her generation in relation to the previous one, in relation to the one before that one, was so profound. Here in Africa, a rich man's death results in the disaster of the wealth he has accumulated over 40 years. Because these children want to kill themselves, one another. They will go to witch doctors because of the boodles struggle. None of them recognize that in order to live a better life that this man has left for you to build on it, you have to manage the boodle, the estate properly, for instance. So it's important, Dominga, that next meetings that we learn the value of time. Time, punctuality, and to be productive during the period that you are assigned. For many of you young people, you are looking at each other and saying, hmm, if I can meet you later in the afternoon, postpone those urges. They will always be there. Trust us, it's not that wonderful after all. Those that are engaging in alcohol abuse, you spend money just to drink something that makes you dizzy like nobody else. So you drink a liquid with color just to be dizzy. Why don't you just then be, be dizzy? I wonder sometimes. Instead of taking something to become dizzy called alcohol and so on. So... We are gathered here to speak about this important matter and it's the first time in the history of this organization that we have such a forum and the discussion that gathers at us around the fire is reigniting youth participation in mod modern politics. There are a couple of assumptions that this subject matter brings about. One of the first assumptions is that it presupposes that young people have played a role in the history of society. And that this participation of young people in society's transformation is nothing new. The second presumption is that the role that young people have played in the past is a role that they must continue to carry on from generation to generation so that there is constant renewal of the opportunities within society, so that there's constant renewal of the values and the norms in society and that there is constant consolidation of what is good and positive and strong in society, while we constantly retreat from what is negative and what takes society backward or puts society in a form of stagnation. The second portion of the subject matter that you will be discussing this whole weekend is politics. Now, I will not go into the definition of modernity because it has various schools of thought that implicate um, its core epistemological uh, uh, existence. But 
I would focus on politics. And politics in its raw form is about who gets what, when, and how. And the leader of the youth command element structured it so well when she spoke amongst others about the population size of young people around the globe and the inability of that numerical size of young people to result in them cutting off for themselves a piece equal to their population size. In other words, if the global population is 60%, then 60% of everything that the earth has to provide must benefit young people. Yes. But is it correct, structured accordingly? Is it the same in Namibia, that the vast majority of population in this country also gains in terms of the budgets, the vast majority of the resources? And this is the challenge that will confront you as you become 30, as you become 40, as you become 50, as you become 60 like some of us or 70 like some of us, what is it that you have gotten across the span of your lifetime? And the answers lie with you. All what we are doing as a political party is to organize you to jointly and with a stronger voice articulate for yourself your own state in society. So politics is about cutting a piece for yourself, and once you have cut off that piece for yourself, to use it for your self-advancement, but also for the advancement of generations to follow. And this is the narrative that we have to deal with in between you getting your share, a member of society as a young person, and then leaving it to the subsequent generation comes the question of the type of leadership that must bind and breach these two frameworks. If you are given, rightfully so, your 60%, the shares of the country or, or of the earth, what type of leadership will you project that will bridge and leave behind something better and greater than what you have inherited? Are you only going to leave to them a 60%? Or would you double it to 120%? Would you triple it? Would you quadruple it? Or after having inherited 60% of what society offers, are you going to leave only 10% behind? Because your leadership was unethical. You were corrupt. You had no vision. You were squandering opportunities. You were keeping others back. You are concerned about your own ethnic group. You are concerned about your own language group or about your own region only. So responsibilities in meetings of this sort, in structures of this sort, are instantaneous. Your responsibility has already begun. Your duty to lead has already begun. You may not feel it because perhaps you want to be recognized in a particular position called a leader of some sort. But the moment you have ascended on planet Earth, your responsibilities actually begin toward yourself and toward the subsequent generation. This is the point where we're missing. And a responsibility that is assigned to you is nothing else but leadership. I'm seeing you are taking notes. I'm happy. I will pause a little bit. So the learned people are talking about words like ratio ascendi. It means the condition of being. The philosophers would say that your material conditions determine your social consciousness. And that is correct. Once you are born, you are born into specific material conditions. Some are princes, queens, and kings. They will never have to suffer to buy a house, to put bread on the table. Their generations are already sorted because they are in the sphere of the society provides for because they have inherent responsibilities and recognitions. 
Or you could be born in an extremely poor circumstance and therefore your material conditions of either poverty, homelessness or landlessness should determine your consciousness. But since the advent of independence on the continent, we have increasingly seen that our material conditions often do not even determine social consciousness. Your social consciousness, once you have assessed your material condition, that I come from a poor background, that I need to educate myself, that I need to help subsequent generations to achieve A, B, and C, what I did not have, that material condition sometimes has not necessarily transformed itself into social consciousness so that you actually do something about the material conditions and change the material conditions. I will repeat that again and I'll put it differently. If you come from a poor background, your social consciousness out of your material conditions, your social consciousness is the level at which you are forced to start to act, to transform the very material conditions that determine your social consciousness. Are we following? But often the material conditions become the only thing that many young people use as an excuse and to constantly play the victim game which then means that your social consciousness has merely become transformed into a vehicle through which you vent your complaints and into which you never transform the conditions that are material into conditions that are not only metaphysical because you have to have connection with the metaphysical forces, but that you do not therefore transform yourself first to do something about conditions that are material to your being. So here you are. You know your circumstances. You know your grandfather has finished each and every bunch of the cattle that he has inherited from your great-grandfather. You know that you live in a shack. You know that many of you have sought jobs. Some of you have gained jobs on a temporary basis. You bought a few things for yourself at the point where you thought you could also well, something else, the job is no more there. Some of you have gone to school, gotten an access to university, dropped out from there from the second year because suddenly coming from Ochivarongo or from Tubuses or from whatever small place, life became so nice. And the cons constant desire to have pleasure has overtaken your social consciousness for which you were supposed to change your material conditions. And so you know that from this weekend on, you will have to go and assess what are my material conditions as Quetages, as Petrus or as Simon and Vula. What are my social and what are my material conditions? How does life look like when I wake up in Ventuk at Greenwald Matongo, or when I wake up at Note or Kalkfeld or Tess, do I, or Undrambamba, have I the ability to eat something this morning so that I can generate through that material condition a social consciousness that would drive me so powerfully that I not only change myself but that my social consciousness is powerful that I can actually join and sustain a group of people that want to transform through a collectivized social consciousness society as a whole. Because that's therefore what we are gathering for. Because we all want now as a collective, I suspect, Dominga, transform through our social consciousness, a collective. We want to transform a collective culture 
through our collective efforts. And that is important. And in this process of social consciousness, the collective becomes more important than the individual. Therefore, that the collective also does not override the individual. And this is where formal liberation movements have made the biggest mistake. And this is also where, where society have succeeded but are also failing. Let me explain what I'm saying. The collective is important. But the collective in socialized fashion that wants to transform society must listen to the component parts that constitute itself. The component parts are the individuals that make the collective. If the collective ignores the vo voices and the concerns of the component parts, the collective can collapse. This is what you have seen with formal liberation movements, where the few elite take positions of responsibility at the level of the state, occupy key positions where they manage resources, ignore the needs of the collective, and determine for themselves that they must accrue to themselves also the resources of the state for their own material benefits. So their social consciousness has driven them into working as formal liberation movements, into working to change material conditions. Once the collective numbers have grown to therefore vote them in power, and the social consciousness becomes collectivized and strong and unified and consolidated mm -hmm. that we then say nobody can challenge the ANC, nobody can challenge ZANU-PF. Once we begin to say it, a few from that group begin to retreat toward changing only their own material conditions instead of the material conditions of the collective. It is called corruption and many other things. But yet you can see, if you turn it around, how Western societies have used the principle of pursuit of happiness of the individual to push that individual to that total self-actualization if I may put it like that. And that individual success is celebrated. And he was now saying, if he were not in politics, and I can confirm that the man can sing, <laughs> he may have been a singer, and a dancer, and an actor. Uh, he knows he has drafted the banana song. You will hear it one day. <laughs> it's one of the hits that are uncelebrated. The banana song. Very important song. The banana song. <laughs> LPM. We are one. We are one. <laughs> yeah. We had a friend uh, that talked about the banana song and then he returned to Sudan after four years. A comrade. Where's the banana song? I'll, I'll, I'll be with you, come on, just wait. We are, we are writing the last verse of the banana song. So the Western society has pushed the individual to their optimal level. But they also recognize that there is a limit to individuality. And that is why they are now organizing Black Lives Matter and other sorts of social movements. Because once you have all the cars and all the houses and all the furniture and all the bank accounts are overflowing with so many millions, what if you achieved if your success has not also helped to change the material conditions of the collective? That is the important. 
So you are coming in essence to a political party where we want you to understand your material conditions, what we would be saying, ratio ascending. You want, we want you to understand and analyze it and then help you then to shape your social consciousness mm -hmm. so that in that process, what they call the ratio cognoscendi, the condition of thought, becomes higher up, escalated to not only about you, but constantly about us. So you have learned two words. Ratio essendi, the conditions of being, and ratio cognoscendi, the condition of thought. In Africa, we have a challenge. Africa is now also undergoing a bit of it, but they are addressing it slightly different. The question of identity. The identity that you as assume in the ratio cognoscendi becomes the identity of your ratio cognoscendi itself. So let me explain a bit. If you say to yourself, I am first and foremost Nama, and everything to do with me is about Namas. How I sing, Nama. How I eat only, Nama food. How I dance only, Langaram and Namastab. How I perceive the world is only through the experiences of the Namas. You have a problem because your ratio cognoscenti is limited to a small jurisdictional ethnocentric space that does not allow you. <laughs> Uh, I'll finish soon. I'll finish soon. Are we together? LPM. We are one. We are one. Uh, yeah, we are one, huh? So when you limit yourself to that jurisdiction, everything about that jurisdiction is right, is perfect, and you do not search to experience other jurisdictions. Mm. And that's what the Marxists say. Therefore, you never become a full self-actualized human being. If I bring it home here, if, as they were saying, anybody in this country forms a political party for one ethnic group only, you fall in that trap of not looking at the country and society as a whole. And those that are told that this political party that policy genuinely out of their material have the social consciousness sufficient to say but even though people say this party belongs to this tribe or that tribe the things that they stand for inform and affect my material conditions yes. and affect my social social consciousness yes. they are not able to join because they are pushed out and that is how African politics has destroyed African society. Because the moment something gets to be strong enough, you cut its wings by speaking of it in identity political terms. Wow. Yes, that's for Herreros. Yeah, that one is for Ovambos. The other one is for Namas. And the other one is for Damaras. And we never therefore reach the crescendo of the collective consciousness that would then allow us to preside over our challenges mm -hmm. with all the tools that we have available from every ethnocentric jurisdiction and to combine forces and say together our social consciousness mm -hmm. determines this is the direction we must walk into. Mm -hmm. This is the challenge that happened in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm where there was eventually a civil war, where the Matabele were beaten up by Mugabe. The majority Shona, 80% Shona. This is what has happened in Namibia, where until today, some of our brothers from Zambezi are called 
they are rebels. But out of injustice, people's frustrations push them to do what they shouldn't have done. But injustice can make even the most peaceful person very, very, very angry. Yes. So I'm speaking to you as young people so that you understand that this party is not about three, four, seven, eight, or how many ethnic groups. It's about all of us yes. together. There are other movements that are founded by a few of the same language group people. They will never be asked the questions of tribalism. There is another one that is a substructure of Swapo. They will go back to Swapo after King Cop leaves. Yes. They are never asked these questions. And you, you know who I'm talking about. Yes. It's a substructure. <laughs> There is another party that is the spokesperson and the side chick of Swapo. Yeah. I will never be asked this question. Never. Never. No one will ask them. There are other older parties. When you look at the party list and Utara and us were looking at it, just one ethnic group from the East, from one to hundred. One ethnic group. No questions asked. <laughs> oh, is it Professor <laughs> Edwards? <laughs> Hello, who <laughs> handed? Yeah, I think other journalists is here. You are so biased at the screen. They will never be asked this question. But those that want to make changes, they need to be fought with something dirty. They need to be labeled as tribal so that people's social consciousness yeah. is affected and that they are deterred because they are told this is not your home it's the home for those that look like utara only <laughs> and this is why what leader dominga was saying is important that you must be reading to understand the Marxists call reading the process of theoretical labor and the production of knowledge. Mm. That's what reading is. It's theoretical labor. Mm. Now, so when you are reading, you are working theoretically. You are enriching yourself. You are structuring your thoughts and your thoughts are being enhanced. And you are chewing and regurgitating and internalizing and recreating some of your thoughts and reshaping and recategorizing your mental faculties and you are shedding off some of your stereotypes and you are respacing the zone of thoughts and consciousness with better information. Therefore, it's theoretical labor. Then you expect it to produce it. And to produce it means to start loving it. Speaking it, yes. acting it, and implementing it, mm -hmm. not to keep to yourself only. Wow. Mm -hmm. That is why there is this professor that is a very serious scientist. People don't want to sit next to that professor at weddings and so on because he starts reproducing too much of the theoretical labor. <laughs> <laughs> now we are at a wedding. We don't want to hear about flowers and that how those flowers scientifically were nidarni. So sometimes the space at which you reproduce it, of course, can become problematic if you don't assess. But you have to reproduce. And part of the challenge in this country and in South Africa as well is that the education system has been depoliticized so that the consciousness of children has become very docile or at best very limited go look at the history books of this country it is nonsense what they teach children it is falsified history 
In Zimbabwe, mm. one of the biggest success stories of Mugabe was a profoundly strong competitive education system. Mm. That's what Mugabe did. In Namibia and South Africa, the education system was messed up. And you can also see how it becomes politicized. Suddenly, through a falsification of facts, a rural school that sometimes doesn't have a full supply of electricity outperforms three, four times an established school with every system. Suddenly, some of the schools are top of the range, but when you go to that school, you look at the teachers, you look at the conditions of the school and so on, you say, ah, but it's because the ones that are marking at the Ministry of Education are given instructions to mark in particular ways to produce the falsification of who is better and who should therefore get access to education. And therefore, education and access to education has become tribalized, yes. not genuinely nationalized, and that education becomes a force for collective liberation and for collective forward movement. That is why sometimes you find PhD holders from Africa <laughs> driving a taxi in New York. Because when he has to go and compete with his peers who are PhD holders in a specific area, this person's capacity is not on par because the education has been destroyed or they have outsourced the assignments and the thesis. They have asked someone else to pay the thesis for them. They have asked someone else to access the examination room on, on the internet and access their pen code and write the exam for them. So PhD holder, but you think your grade 12 year old, grade 12 child knows 10 times better than the PhD holder. Mm -hmm. This is what Africa has been, has begotten from liberation movements. Uh -huh. There are other African leaders, because I'm talking about theoretical labor. There are African leaders whose policies in terms of building and recreating opportunities in their countries, whose policies have failed, but they are respected. And you ask why? You go to Julius Nyerere and they will tell you, he did not steal anything from state coffers. He did not promote tribalism. And he lived in his ordinary house as he lived before he became a president. His policies failed, but his humanity did not fail. His consciousness did not fail. You and I, we are in a battle against a falsified and corrupted consciousness of those that were heroes of yesterday that have become zeros of today. We are in that space. That's why all they can tell us is order, please, order, 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 order. Because there's nothing more they can say. Because they need us to be quiet. They need you to be quiet there in, in Tumep, in Oshakati. They need you to be quiet, child, in Onipa. Quiet, order, order. I'm older than you and your mother. Order, order. You must respect elders' order. In Ketman's order. And if you don't have that order, please, police, take them out. Suspend them. Because the consciousness is what we are challenging. And there are the thing with the conscious mind. And she, she Professor Edwards will tell you, is that even a criminal has relapses of sanity. Say, Ish, I shouldn't have done it. Ish, where we are today. Eh, I, I, I was not like that. Ooh, but check my bank balance. There's been parts of the moral compass and the moral center 
and their consciousness became something different. But they have relapses. They have relapses. And when they get those relapses, the shame is on them. But will they retire? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Because their material conditions were transformed by their consciousness that became selfish, individualized, and family-centric. They call it bare-faced greed. I wish I could say it in Oshera or something. Bare-faced greed. Now, if you look at somebody's face and they have cut each and every piece of hair down, there's nothing here. Bare-faced. There's just the bare face, you know, that type of greed. Mm? They, they, they have cut everything down so that as they go into steel, nothing can burn them or scratch them. It's clean and, and bare face. They, they go in for the kill and, and they, they don't even blink because it has become a new consciousness, a false consciousness. They have been transformed by the state. We are in that battle. So some of you are counselors. Some of you are counselors. Some of you are members of parliament. Some of you are aspiring. Some of you will go back and speak to your friends. Can't go home my time. I must finish in the next five minutes. You have to go back to others and speak about them. You have to speak about them. To get them to join you. Yes. Speak about their circumstances. Not about your cleverness. You have to speak to them. About them. With them. So that we are able to collectively get to a point. Where Namibian youth. Join this great chorus. And movement. And this belt. This transmission belt. Of a new consciousness. We are, of course, in an organic crisis. What is an organic crisis? Some would say it is when subordinate becomes potentially directive. There are various interpretations for that. But if we turn it around and say we are the subordinate ones, we are the ones that are now outside government, Someone else is controlling the systems of state and its resources. But if we can become so strong, well mobilized, well sensitized, well represented everywhere in the country, that we can take over, then we start <coughs> to be leaders of society. And that's the point we are driving to. Each one of you, each one of you that came today is to be transformed into an agent of change. So you coming here is not to come and see Ventuk and to entertain yourself and to have exchange of telephone numbers for social and romantic purposes. Yours is theoretical and practical labor that you must go and implement immediately Monday wherever you come from because it is ultimately about your future and your children's future that this fight is about. I want to just take a little bit from this book. It's how the best leaders lead. Of course, some people have concerns about how I lead, what type of leader Henny is, and some senior politicians are saying, ah, maybe these guys are just screaming and shouting on people and they forget that we are the most nicest guys. Uh, gentle person, 
who are merely determined and focused and we don't like we don't take nonsense or we don't also give nonsense we try to educate and unify the country and because we time to educate sometimes when you teach you are a little bit frustrated you speak a little louder your face looks a little bit more stricter because you are not in a comedy show you are not in a Trevor Noah show where you are laughing from morning till evening. Even if somebody does a mistake, you say, that mistake you did was nonsense. Then you couldn't have done it because you were told last week how to do this. But you have improved here and there. Well done. But stop being nervous, for instance. That's how we lead. That's how we engage decently but firmly, because we were also decently, but firmly raised at our homes. His grandfather was tough, Emmanuel Sebe. Tough old people will push you off the donkey cart if you are not man enough. Say, you must wakker slap, young. Now, wakker and slap doesn't go together. But anyway, Emmanuel Sebe, may his soul rest in peace. You have from this meeting and this meeting must, in fact, set certain goals and actually work to achieve those goals. And those goals must not be abstract. They must be very clear goals. You, Kwedage, or you, uh, Elaine, or you, Sal, or Mvula, or whoever, you go back with a clear purpose that you will mobilize 600 people by the end of this year. That's a clear goal. And the next one will do the same and the next one will do the same. And if your village has 600 people, that means you have everybody with you. And you can also say because you are in the church choir, you are in the church, you, you are almost an older at the church there in Onipa or Shakati there and some of the old people listen to you you will also mobilize 200 old people. <laughs> That's a clear goal. It's not abstract. It's not maybe I can try or maybe or I don't know or what do you think? No. So you have to set clear goals from this meeting because we are sending you out to go and grow the youth command element. You will be given responsibility. Each one of you where you come from, you will be given opportunity to sit together with us later tonight or tomorrow you will be given tasks i will speak about ideological issues tomorrow also you will be given tasks some young people are lazy some young people are hard working only seasonally so you have to go and identify those that work consistently hard that's what obama didn't want to work with people who on a sunday their energy levels are up there you can't reach them because they are busy their energy is two thousand percent Tuesday afternoon, the energy is at zero. And for the rest of the week, you cannot find them. I'm too stressed. I have emotional issues. Please don't. That type of person you have to sort out and say, when they have energy, take their ideas. But don't be bothered. If they are not coming, they are ups and downs. You want a straight line. What is the issue? Consistency. You have as leaders from this meeting onward to identify problems but also solutions this is not a platform to complain mm -hmm. we know about youth unemployment we are furious about it we know about the opportunities that you are being denied we are furious about it all of us we know about the chances of how the economy will grow or not grow in the next two three years it does not look good we are furious about it so you have to have a problem-solving mind for every problem that you raise. Don't just raise a problem and leave it. Raise it, solve it, implement the solution. Thirdly, you have to set priorities in terms of your mobilization. You have to set priorities. You can talk to your peers. You can engage yourself, one another, at a music festival or at a Miss Groot Fontaine Festival. You look at us, 
we are starting to be gray. Sometimes when we look at the mirrors, we can't believe it is us. We are not sure whether we have improved or degenerated. But you can speak better to your constituents. To speak to your constituents in a way a leader must speak requires you to read. You have to be ahead of the ones you want to lead. You do not have, you should be behind in terms of capacity. Yes. Yeah? You can't read his note and expect to convince someone that is reading political science books. Yeah? Thank you, mommy. You can't. Yeah, or what is the thing? Kick off and uh, you drum and you watch generations and yet you want to lead society. No. And, and it matters. You, 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 the way you spend your time. You are rushing five o'clock. This person is rushing. Hey, I can't. Wasting time. Because that is also how capital and capitalism takes you away from serious issues of society. He was saying the moment he didn't have a TV in his room for two years, the level of reading he went into. There is another leader, Antonio Stierman. Mm. Big, beautiful house. No television. Tell a novella, Radamas Basanda, Gadoba. Those things we're watching at you. No. You are leaders now. You are leaders. You are leaders. Kim Kardashian. Uh, uh, you want to, what happened? Update me. No, no, don't stress me about LPM. Update me. And then what did Kim do? No. We're keeping up with the, what is it? Kardashians, huh? Now the question is, how do I know? That's the question. LPM. We are one. LPM. I just see there. I don't know. And you have to set higher standards for yourself. There are some of you that I'm actually sometimes very furious with. Some in Ochodanjuba in particular. They just don't grow fast enough. And when they grow and you think they have grown now, not you this time. When they have grown the next meeting, you say, oh my goodness. Four steps forward, ten steps backward. Don't grow like that. Don't also project arrogance as a credo of leadership. Mandela says that. Be humble. When he was asked about what he intends to do with his life after he got out of prison, he says, of course, he knew that was not going to be the case. But just listen to this. He says, I'm even prepared to work as a security guard at Lutuli House. That's the headquarters of the ANC. One of those that are leaders now in government says, I like power. You control people with power. Yeah. You say, oh, 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 that doesn't sound right. Something is wrong. Here. So you have to set higher goals for yourself. Young people, you know politics. Whether you are in America or in Germany, politics, you walk by your feet toward political success. Mm -hmm. When I go to Korichas, mm -hmm. I'm on my feet. I walk faster. My feet hurt, but I pretend that there is nothing called pain in my yes. feet. Yes. 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 When I come home, my wife would massage me, but when I'm among you, I'm the fittest. The sun doesn't exist when I'm among people talking. Politics, you go to the person. Door to door. House to house. Person to person. Youth to youth. Girl to boy. Boy to girl. 
girl and boy to another girl and boy, girls and boys to other girls and boys, other girls and boys to the whole neighborhood, the whole neighborhood to the other neighborhood, to the whole town, the whole town, to the whole region and to the whole country. That is politics. Don't tell me here about Facebook politics. It's good, it's fine, but no, no, no. There was a candidate we had from Cory House. I have 7,000 followers. Then this candidate was recognized by a few people in Bunduk, and the candidate says, it's here. Ah, Muicha. I come to again, Anel. People even know me in Bunduk. That's how popular I am. I will win the position of regional councillor in Korihas constituency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We lost. We lost. We're 7,000, 8,000 followers. We lost the election. You go village to village, speak to persons. Then you have to foster innovative ideas. How do you get to these young people? How do you motivate them? If you get stuck, talk to us. We know a thing or two. No wonder we look the way we look. We know a thing or two about advising you. That is why one of the first things you don't do when you're campaigning around mm. is to dress up like you are going to a church yeah. and to smell in a way that the person who lives in the Blackest Dorp cannot even listen to you because they sneeze because the perfume that you have used uh, wow. is of a higher level. Mm -hmm. We don't know once they spray and use perfume. You dress what people dress. You eat what the people eat. Mm -hmm. You use their level of understanding. Come down to their level. And from there, you build it. You talk about them, not about you, not about which places you have seen. So on that note, I welcome, you have been welcome, but I welcome you to a hard working session. There are Professor Lucy Edwards here. Uh, there is, I think, uh, Sindiso Moyo. Sindiso, actually. Sindiso Moyo, a youth development consultant. These are serious people. You have to internalize. Right. I like the way that you are writing. Right. Mm -hmm. And then there will be group discussions. We want to see who among you are emerging stronger and stronger because you will have assignments in the regions from Sunday afternoon. Your work starts now. The meeting is officially open. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, LPM Youth Command. Now, just to, to really see if you guys have been listening. What were the two new words? Can somebody tell me what were the two new words that we have learned today? Any volunteer? Or oh, I'll point you out. Tiffany? Leader Tiffany? Is it? Speak a bit louder. <laughs> Thank you very much. Clap heads for her, please. <laughs> now, before we go into the next session, I am given the honor to as well give the closing remarks. But before we go into the closing remarks, I think it is very important um, what our LCCC told us in regards to time. Mm -hmm. I myself find it very difficult to, to, to be disciplined with time.
And you see how your world can go upside down if you're not punctual. Mm -hmm. Things that you're supposed to do, you become ineffective just because you couldn't keep five minutes before the time. And I think young people, we like to say, wing it. We'll just wing it. And we'll get away with things because we're young. We'll come late to things and people, the elders will say, yeah, we are young, it's fine. But if we want to be the leaders of now, I don't believe that we are the leaders of the future. I believe that we are the leaders of now. Because if you have that ideology that you are the leaders of the future, then you're going to do what exactly the previous generation has done to us, to the next generation. And that is to control power. This is our time, right? And with that, I would like to go into a very important quote that I always, always hold dear to my heart by Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill was the previous prime minister of, of, of um, the Great Britain before all of us were born, I believe. Not, not all of us. The, <laughs> the Altropus was six years old. <laughs> he says, Hear this young men and women everywhere and proclaim it far and wide. The earth is yours and the fullness therefore. Be kind but fierce. You are needed now more than ever before. Take up the mantle of change for this time is your time. Mm. With this, we're going to the next program. Now, should I walk out and come back in? Because there's a next session, but it's going to be awkward. So I'll just give a five-minute break, and then we get back. Oh. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.